Hi everyone, my name is Junwoo Kim, and I'm here to give you a talk on our paper, Semantics Guided Synthesis. So, uh, Semantics Guided Synthesis is a paper about program synthesis, which, uh, broadly speaking, refers to the process of automatically generating a program given some specifications that are input by a user. And a big part about this paper is about develop developing a framework or a method for specifying program synthesis problems, hence the name Semantics Guided Synthesis, and a way to solve problems that are defined in the Semantics Guided Synthesis framework both of which I'm going to talk about today. So before diving into the details, since we're defining a new framework for program synthesis, I'm going to start off by answering the question, well, what does its framework do? Or why do we need such a new framework? Uh, to see this, let's consider a hypothetical scenario in which Alice is trying to synthesize um, an imperative program. Alice would have a few options for doing this. For example, um, one of the options she would have is to encode her program synthesis problem in a general program synthesizer like Sketch. Uh, however, if the first option does not work well, which is very possible since program synthesizers uh, tend to have unpredictable behavior, another option that Alice would have is to try and use another general program synthesizer like Rosette, or write her own synthesizer maybe for synthesizing imperative programs. And one of the problems here is that although it's unlikely that Alice is going to know a priori which of the three solvers is actually going to solve her problem, all of these tools pose different syntactic restrictions of their own. So for example, um, Sketch uh, is written in, is based in the language C, Rosette is based in Racket, and similarly, um, Alice's solver is also likely to be tied to a specific language that she chose. So, and because of this, Alice is going to have to encode her problem three times in different syntactic formats to try all these solvers out, even though semantically, Alice is trying to only solve a single particular program synthesis problem. Now, in a similar scenario, let's assume that Bob comes along, and Bob wants to synthesize um, regular expressions. Bob is going to have a similar set of choices to Alice. He could try um, a general program synthesizer out, he could write his own synthesizer, or he could try a specialized solver for synthesizing regular expressions. And the same scenario, the same problem holds here. Bob is going to have to re-encode his problem every time in a different syntactic format when he wants to try a new solver, although semantically, he's just trying to synthesize the same regular expression problem. Now, this problem is partly addressed by the syntax guided synthesis framework, which gives you a language agnostic way of um, expressing synthesis problems that, that are defined over expressions. However, syntax guided synthesis is limited to synthesizing only expressions over a supported background theory, and there are also some differences between the kinds um, of problems that um, syntax guided synthesis and other solver-aided languages like Sketch can express. Um, for example, solver-aided languages like Sketch are unable to express syntax guided synthesis problems with infinite search spaces, while syntax guided synthesis cannot express problems that contain semantics outside of supported theory, uh, such as imperative programs that contain loops. So ultimately, if you consider all the scenarios that we've looked at up until now, basically what you get is that you need to do a lot of repetitive work for trying to solve the same problem, which honestly is not an ideal scenario. Our answer to this problem is the Semantics Guided Synthesis Framework, uh, shortened as the SEMGAS Framework, where the aim is for the SEMGAS Framework to be a language-agnostic, logic-based framework for specifying program synthesis problems that can possibly de be defined over arbitrary semantics. That is, SEMGAS aims to be a format in which you can easily express various different synthesis problems that can contain different semantics depending on the problem that you're trying to express. Um, one intuitive way to think about the SEMGIS framework is as an intermediate representation for program synthesis problems. Uh, as we mentioned before, one can express many different synthesis problems that can contain different semantics in the SEMGIS framework. For example, you might express synthesis problems defined over an imperative language, you might um, define program synthesis problems over regular expressions, or you might just define simple synthesis problems over expressions. And um, once you have a SEMGIS problem like this, one can automatically dispatch this problem to multiple different backend SEMGIS solvers, similar to how a compiler can generate multiple versions of machine code given a single intermediate representation. And because the user does not have to write um, separate synthesis problems for each solver they want to try, this greatly reduces the amount of work that the user has to do in defining a synthesis problem. Um, the focus of our paper and this talk is about defining the SEMGIS framework and a SEMGIS problem, as well as developing a solving procedure for SEMGIS problems. And to start off, let's start off by uh, defining a SEMGIS problem. Um, a SEMGIS problem is made up of three components. 
It has a language syntax, which acts as um, the syntactic restriction for the SEMGIS problem. It has a semantics for the language, and it has a specification of what the synthesized program should do. I'm going to talk about the syntactic component first, and to represent syntax, um, we use the standard idea of regular tree grammars, which are basically a set of productions on non-terminals. For example, um, we might use this example grammar to specify a synthesis problem that computes the maximum of variables x and y. You can see that it contains um, if-then-else statements, um, if-then-else expressions and comparison, which should be enough to synthesize the maximum. Another example can be given as the syntax for regular expressions, as um, I've just displayed. This contains operations, operations such as concatenations and um, Quaney star. And as a last example, I'm going to show you an example of a grammar that can that illustrates a set of imperative programs that can contain loops. Um, we have that the non-terminal start goes to a while loop while we do s, and the grammar also contains operators such as bitwise and and bitwise or, as well as sequential composition and assignments to variables. Uh, basically, what this grammar does is that it defines a set of programs over bit vectors, as illustrated by the bitwise operators, that can contain um, while loops. And we're going to use this grammar as the running example throughout our talk. And now notice that here, I showed you three different grammars that are clearly often equipped with um, different semantics. And this brings us to defining a semantics for the language, which is the core feature of SEMGUS that sets it apart from other synthesis frameworks. And one of the core ideas behind SEMGUS is that semantics for a language can be formalized using the concept of constrained horn clauses. Semantics for languages in SEMGIS are provided on a production-by-production -production basis, uh, similar to how one would supply operational semantics to operators. So let's consider the non-terminal S in our language with its associated productions. So for example, here one would provide semantics um, for the production S goes to S semicolon S, S goes to X equals E, and S go goes to Y equals E. And to supply semantics to productions, we first need to understand how to formally express the semantics for a term. Um, to do this, we need to understand that S is non-terminal that contains statements like assignment, which can be viewed as state transformers. So in other words, one can think of all terms in being in S as being a function that has type um, state to state. So for example, the semantics of the term x equals x bitwise and y is going to change the value of x from 1 in the input state to 0 in the output state, where I've highlighted the terms in red and the states in green. To capture the semantics of terms, we're going to introduce a semantic relation for the non-terminal S, named SEMS, that takes as input two states and a term, and outputs a Boolean value since it's a relation. The key idea is that this relation is going to evaluate to true if and only if the two supplied states um, to the relation satisfy an input-output relation when evaluated using the supplied term. So for example, um, in the example on the right, the relation sem s evaluates to true if it's supplied um, x goes to 1 and y goes to 0 as the input state, x equals um, x bitwise and y as the term, and x goes to 0, y goes to 0 as the output state, exactly as we saw in the case with the ordinary semantics above. In general, sem s gamma t gamma prime for um, input states gamma output state gamma prime and term t s is going to be true uh, if and only if um, ts executed on gamma results in gamma prime. And once we can express semantics for terms using relations in this manner, it becomes easy to supply productions with semantics. Um, for example, one could write a standard semantics for a term um, x equals te in the production s goes to x equals e using the inference rule below by computing the semantics of term te and assigning it to x. One can also write this uh, semantic rule using our semantic relations, sem e and sem s, to model the semantics of the term te, which is a term in the non-terminal e, and the term x equals te, which is a term in the non-terminal s. And it turns out that writing semantics in this format directly coincides with um, the definition of constrained horn clauses, which are simply implications that have a single relation as the conclusion, or the formula head, and a conjunction of relations with the first order constraint as the premise. Um, one important thing to note about constrained horn clauses is that the variables are universally quantified, which means that the rule holds for all possible variable configurations. Um, in our case, in our example here, um, sem s is going to hold for all gamma and gamma 1 that satisfies the premises above. 
And expressing semantics using constrained horn clauses in this way um, not only gives us a formal logic-based method for expressing semantics, it can also make it easier to reason about semantics as um, constrained horn clauses, also known as CHCs, are relatively easier to solve and more well-studied compared to arbitrary SMD formulas as shown by solvers like Spacer. Also, in reverse, um, CHCs can also be thought of as inference rules like um, written on the top. We'll sometimes use the term semantic rules to refer to the um, CHCs applied as semantics throughout the talk. For some productions, one needs to perform case analysis. Um, for example, in while loops, the behavior is different depending on what the condition evaluates to. In cases like these, we can supply separate semantic rules, or CHCs, for when the condition is true and the loop iterates, or when the condition is false and the loop terminates. So, now that we know how to express the semantics in a SEMGIS problem, the only component left remaining to define a SEMGIS problem is a specification. Um, in general, one often uses a logical formula to define a specification for a synthesis problem. For example, the formula on the bottom here states that the result of the synthesized function f, when run on the inputs x and y, should equal x bitwise or xor y. Um, another common way of giving a specification to a synthesis problem is through a set of examples. And in the example given here, we're saying that the result of executing f on the input 6 and 9, which you can think of as an input state where x goes to 6 and y goes to 9, ends up in an output state where um, x goes to 15 and y can be any value, which is represented by the um, wildcard underbar. And you may be wondering here that giving just a single example as the specification to a synthesis problem could be problematic, but if the synthesized program f is wrong, one can always generate counterexamples and add them to the example set, which is the concept behind um, a technique known as counterexample guided inductive synthesis, which is commonly used in um, solver aided languages such as Sketch. The SEMGAS framework is capable of accepting both formats, but for today's talk, we're going to be focusing on the specification given using examples. So now that we know how to define a SEMGAS problem, syntax, semantics, and specification, let's go over to the second part of this talk, which is about solving a SEMGAS problem. Our key idea here is that given a SEMGAS problem, we can reduce the synthesis problem into solving a query over constrained horn clauses, CHCs, by introducing another constrained horn clause that captures the definition of program synthesis. If you think about the definition of program synthesis, you want to find a term inside your grammar, which is represented by um, the premise on the left, that according to the semantics that you supplied, satisfies um, the specifications that are given to the SEMGIS problem. And since the semantics are already constrained horn clauses, all that's left to reduce the program synthesis problem into answering a query over CHCs is to express your syntax, your regular tree grammar, using constrained horn clauses as well. And we can do this in a similar way to the way we express semantics using constrained horn clauses. To see how to express a regular tree grammar using constrained horn clauses, let's consider the production S goes to S semicolon S. What this production essentially tells us is that given um, two terms, t1 and t2, both of which are valid terms in the language of the non-terminal S, the term t1 semicolon t2 is also going to be a valid term in the language of S. So to capture this information, we're going to introduce a syntax relation, sin S, for the non-terminal S, similar to how we introduce the semantic relation for the non-terminal S, which is going to tell us whether a term is valid in the language of S or not. So put simply, um, sin st for a term t is going to be true if and only if t is a valid term in the language of s. Then we can model the information on the right given as a production using a constrained horn clause, which is saying that um, sin s t1 semicolon t2 is true, meaning that t1 semicolon t2 is a valid term in the language of s, if sin st1 and sin st2, which means that t1 and t2 are also valid terms in the language of s. So now that we understand how to model syntax using constrained horn clauses, we can write a premise using the syntax relation that we just defined, saying that t is some valid term in the starting non-terminal start. And we already know how to write the semantics of the term t by using the semantic relations that were given as the semantics, and by adding the input-output examples from the specification, um, the completed premises state that we want to find a term t that when executed on the input example, we get the output example, which is the definition of program synthesis. Um, once we've constructed the program synthesis problem as um, a constrained horn clause, a CHC, or inference rule in this way, one can understand the synth synthesis procedure as a proof search for the final predicate realizable. 
So let's consider our run example where the term um, while x is smaller than y, do x equals um, x bit y or y is a valid solution on our single example that the input state x goes to 6 and y goes to 9 should result in a state where x goes to 15. Um, I've once again colored the terms in red and the states in green here, and um, one can consider the search step of program synthesis, um, finding a term, as corresponding to proving the syntactic premise uh, since start t. And in the proof for since start t, um, we're going to be using the inference rules, which are the CHCs that we generated by expressing our grammar using constrained horn clauses. Um, for example, since the outermost production of the term t is a while loop, one would be applying the syntax rule generated by the production start goes to while b do s as the first step of the proof. Um, similarly, to prove that um, to prove the new premise um, sin b x is smaller than y, then one would apply the syntax rule generated by the production um, b goes to e is smaller than e, and apply other generated rules in a similar manner to get a whole proof tree for. Um, since start t, which essentially tells us that t is indeed a valid term in the language of the starting non-terminal start. After proving that t is a valid term, we also need to prove that t has the correct semantics for um, t to be a solution, which is expressed by the second premise using the semantic relations and the specification. And the proof for the semantic premise sem start is going to proceed in a similar manner to the proof for the syntax relation, by applying the semantic rules, the constrained horn clauses, that were given as semantics in the Semgus problem. For example, again, the outermost production of t is a while loop, so we can apply the semantics, the CHCs, specified for while loops as the first step in the proof for sem start. And similarly, one can apply the given semantic rules to prove the other premises and complete the proof for the sem start relation, which tells us that t executed on the input example x goes to 6 and y goes to 9 will indeed result in an output state where x goes to 15 as required by our specification. Once we've generated a valid proof tree in this manner, this proof tree contains um, itself the synthesized term t, and you can also recover t by traversing the application of the syntax rule. And thus, voila, I've shown you how proving the predicate realizable, um, which corresponds to solving a query over constrained horn clauses, corresponds to program synthesis. And although here we've constructed the proof tree by hand, in practice, CHC solvers such as Spacer will be able to automatically generate a proof tree for you, which gives us an automated solving method for SEMGIS problems. Um, up until now, the semantics that we consider for a language were sort of a standard semantics for that language. However, Semgus gives us the freedom of um, equipping a language with whatever semantics we want to, and this turns out to be a very interesting and powerful ability, as I'll discuss in our next section, using alternative semantics with Semgus. Um, the idea of using constrained horn clauses to express program semantics is not necessarily limited to a standard semantics that one would equip, typically equip a language with, um, constrained horn clauses can be used to model any kind of semantics that can be expressed at, um, in a big step operational fashion, which includes abstract semantics, um, other custom semantics such as the semantics that bounds the number of loop iterations, or semantics that are defined over custom operators, which one might use to express um, synthesis problems over regular expressions or other domain specific languages. Um, let's talk about abstract semantics first, which were previously used in program synthesis in previous work by Wang and others. So let's consider the simple expression x bitwise and y, for which um, one could give a standard semantics using the inference rule below, which basically says that um, the semantics of x result in vx, the semantics of y result in vy, and the semantics of um, x bitwise and y result in the bitwise and of the values vx and vy. Um, now let's consider the semantics of um, x bitwise and y when using an abstract domain that considers only the first bit for each value. And one could give a modified semantics for bitwise and in this case um, by using the infer inference rule below where the changed parts are um, written in blue. So here the semantics of x and y return values bx and by which are either a concrete bit or a top value to represent the scenario in which we've lost precision, and the value can either be true or false. And here, the resulting value b can um, either be the standard and of bx and by if um, both of them are not top, or it could be top if either x and y are top and they've lost precision. 
And similar to the way we express standard semantics as constrained horn clauses, these abstract semantics can just as easily be expressed um, in constrained horn clauses as well by changing the signature of the semantic relations to return um, a bit or a top value instead of a standard value and adding the top information to the constraint part. Previous work on program synthesis um, using abstract semantics and domains mostly focuses on refining the domain to ultimately synthesize a program. Um, today, we're going to do something different and um, use abstract semantics to consider synthesis problems that possibly have no solution in the search space. So the theorem here is that because abstract semantics are an over-approximating semantics, the absence of a solution under the abstract semantics implies that there is also no solution when using the standard semantics. We'll talk a bit more about synthesis problems that contain no solution in the search space in the evaluation. But before that, um, following the idea that an over-approximating or an abstract semantics can be useful for program synthesis, let's talk about how an under-approximating semantics can be useful, such as a semantics that bounds the number of loop iterations, which is similar to how there is an unrolling bound in solver-aided solver languages like Sketch and Rosette. Since we're talking about loop iterations, we need to consider the semantics of loops, the standard version of which can be given using the inference rule below. One can give a version of this rule that limits the number of iterations to k by adding the extra parameter k, which needs to be bigger than zero for the loop to execute, and is decremented on future iterations of the loop, highlighted in blue. Similar to the case with the abstract semantics, um, the semantics containing k can be expressed just as easily using constrained horn clauses, this time by extending the semantic relation for loops to contain the unrolling parameter k in addition to the state parameters it carries around. Similar to the case with abstract semantics again, there is a theorem for semantics with bounded loops. Because the semantics are precise with respect to the original semantics, given that the loop terminates in less than k steps, if t is a solution using bounded loop semantics, then t is also a solution using the standard semantics. What we've seen through the examples with um, abstract semantics and semantics with bounded loops is that the flexibility of semantics in SEMGIS is actually a very powerful tool. Essentially, what this flexibility allows you to do is that it allows you to express existing ideas and optimizations from programming languages and apply it to the synthesis problem that you're trying to solve by capturing that idea directly into the semantics and supplying it to the SEMGIS problem. And it turns out that these optimizations um, expressed as semantics are indeed very effective, as we'll shortly see in the next final results section. Right. So as the last part of this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the more interesting results that came out from our experiments with SEMGIS, such as comparisons between different semantics and um, synthesis problems that do not contain solutions within the given search space. Um, OK, so to begin, our SEMGIS solver, Messy, implements our constrained horn clause based method for solving SEMGIS problems that we um, described a few sections ago. Specifically, it takes as input a SEMGIS problem and internally translates the SEMGIS problem into a set of constrained horn clauses, which contains the constrained horn clauses that expresses program synthesis that we described um, a few slides ago. Then it queries Z3, or more specifically Spacer, which is the CHC solver of Z3, um, which is capable of solving if the generated set of constrained horn clauses is satisfiable or not. Um, Z3 can tell us whether the given set of constrained horn clauses is satisfiable, in which case um, we explained how one can recover a term from Z3 through the proof for satisfiability. Um, another scenario is um, that Z3 can tell us uh, that the given set of constrained horn clauses is unsatisfiable, which corresponds to the scenario in which the synthesis problem has no solution in the search space. Um, we call problems such as these unrealizable, prob unrealizable problems and this phenomenon unrealizability in general. And one of the cool things about Messy is that, to the best of our knowledge, it's the only tool that's capable of giving such a two-sided answer for general program synthesis problems, because most program synthesizers do not consider unrealizability at all, and tools for proving unrealizability lack the ability to synthesize programs. Um, we evaluated our tool Messy on some benchmarks that were realizable, um, which means that they are solvable and that they contain a solution within the search space, and other benchmarks that were unrealizable. We took 60 realizable SIGUS benchmarks from um, the linear integer arithmetic track and 67 realizable benchmarks for imperative programs, um, some of which were written by hand and some of which were took from a previous paper on synthesizing imperative programs by so and others. 
For unrealizable benchmarks, we took 132 benchmarks um, that are fully expressible in linear integer arithmetic from previous work on proving unrealizability by who and others, and we also generated 222 unrealizable benchmarks over imperative programs as variants of our um, realizable imperative benchmarks. These benchmarks were um, made unrealizable by deleting certain operators from the grammar. When using standard semantics for a language, Messi was only able to solve three benchmarks, all three of which were imperative, out of 60 expression and 67 realizable ben imperative realizable benchmarks. However, one interesting thing to note here is that um, using the semantics with bounded loops, Messi was able to synthesize solutions to three other imperative benchmarks for a total of six imperative benchmarks solved using bounded loops. Um, in total, Messi was able to synthesize solutions to 12 realizable benchmarks, four of, four of which were um, the Saigas LIA benchmarks, and eight of which were imperative benchmarks, and this total is calculated over some other semantics as well, such as vectorized semantics, that are described in the paper but we did not have time to discuss in the talk today. On unrealizable benchmarks, Messi was able to prove um, a total of 66 benchmarks unrealizable using the standard semantics. Um, on the other hand, using the abstract semantics, Messi was able to prove a total of 55 benchmarks as unrealizable, um, 18 of which were expre expression benchmarks, and 37 of which were imperative. Um, the interesting part here is that when you visualize the distribution of the solved benchmarks, you can see that the um, standard semantics uniquely solved 38 expression benchmarks, while the abstract semantics uniquely solved 27 imperative benchmarks. In total, Messi could prove 178 benchmarks unrealizable, 66 of which were expression and 112 of which were imperative. And again, part of this is due to the other semantics that we could not discuss in this talk. But the important part here is that we can see that different semantics can indeed solve a different set of synthesis problems, which confirms our idea that experimenting with different ideas and optimizations expressed as different, um, different semantics supplied to a SEMGAS problem indeed has merit. Now here, uh, you may be intrigued that Messi seems to have far better performance for proving unrealizability versus synthesizing programs. And to provide a rough hypothesis of why that's the case, I'm going to walk you through a final example of how Messi proves unrealizability for a synthesis problem. So let's go back to our running example with a while loop, um, except that we've added an additional example here where um, x goes to 14, y goes to 15, and x in the output state goes to 1. So adding this problem makes the problem unrealizable because um, our previous answer was equivalent to bitwise or, and using bitwise or, you can't get um, one in the output state when given the input states 14 and 15 for x and y. So to see how unrealizability is proved for this problem, let's consider the productions that the non-terminal E has. Um, it can go to the variable x, it can go to the variable y, it can um, take a bitwise and, or it can take a bitwise or. Now, for our additional example, the underlying solver Z3 can automatically prove a lemma that states that for um, any x prime and y prime that comes out as the result of the program or the non-terminal start, the bitwise and of x prime and the number 4 will always be 4, which states that, um, which means that the third bit of the value stored in x prime is always going to be set. And you can see that this is indeed the case with um, our example in languages, because E can only take bitwise AND and bitwise OR operations, and both input examples, 14 and 15, have the third bit set when they are represented in bit vector format. And now, the desired output 1 definitely does not have its third bit set, so there's a contradiction, and the problem is unrealizable. The hypothesis for why Messi performs better on unrealizability versus program synthesis is that because to prove unrealizability, one only needs to find a lemma of um, the form above, which can be done internally in Z3, versus when trying to synthesize programs, Z3 needs to construct a full proof tree, which could be more um, expensive computationally. Right, so um, in conclusion, in this talk, we've shown you the definition of the SEMGAS framework and a SEMGAS problem, We've shown you a constrained horn clause based method for solving SEMGAS problems. We've showed you how to use um, alternative semantics in SEMGAS and what they bring about. And we also showed you some interesting new results such as um, proving unrealizability for imperative programs that we proved using SEMGAS in our solving procedure. Um, as we've mentioned multiple times in the talk before, um, SEMGAS is designed to be a framework, so we really, really hope that a lot of more work will come out of this. 
Um, for example, we definitely need more benchmarks for Zangus, and we're experimenting with building different solvers for Zangus problems as well. Um, there are also practical issues that we need to address for um, Zemgus to become more widely adopted, such as efficiency and scalability. And finally, Zemgus also opens the way um, to a lot of new exciting theoretical questions. Um, for example, can we rely on this applied semantics to a Zemgus problem in a similar manner to proving unrealizability to prune the search space and guide program synthesis as well? So I hope that after hearing this talk, you're as excited on these problems as I am. And that wraps up our talk, and thanks for listening.